Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left off with George Thomas, the Mexican-American War had ended, and Thomas had traveled to his hometown in Southampton County, Virginia. Thomas remained in Southampton County for about six months until he rejoined his artillery unit at Fort Adams in Rhode Island. There, he remained just a little over a month before he and his group were sent back to Florida. It had been seven years since he had been in the state and tensions between the Seminoles and Whites had simmered down. He arrived in Florida in the fall of 1849 and acted as commander for a series of forts in the state's interior. While there, he felt for the Seminoles in their situation. He had spent his last stint in Florida battling Native Americans, but now sympathized with them. Thomas criticized the federal government for its treatment of them, especially when the Seminoles acted in what he termed good faith and agreed to move to southern Florida away from white settlement to keep from being sent west of the Mississippi River. He wrote to his brother that, as they have agreed to take more territory out of land which would never be settled by whites, it would be by far the best policy to make this treaty with them and get rid of this business. The assignment in the intense Florida heat was miserable, and Thomas longed for another assignment, maybe a commissary assignment in Washington, D.C. He could have easily followed in the footsteps of many West Point graduates and resigned from the Army to take a more lucrative job as an engineer in the private sector. Thomas's decision to remain in the Army seems to have been a moral one, as he viewed the worlds of business and politics as corrupt ones, where honor was not respected and where a man with a high sense of integrity would have a difficult time. Thomas's sense of honor and distaste for the business world led him to stay in the military regardless of the difficulties of his assignments and the difference between what he earned as an officer and what he could have earned as a commercial engineer. While Thomas languished in Florida, others were working on his behalf. West Point was looking for an instructor of artillery and cavalry, and Braxton Bragg, Thomas's former commander, wrote letters to George's congressman encouraging him to approach the War Department about assigning George to that position. In December 1850, he received the position, and he would officially report for duty on April 1st, 1851. When he arrived, Thomas quickly looked over the equipment that he was to use as an instructor. He found that the cannons the cadets were to practice on were old and heavy guns, but he was having to instruct them on light artillery tactics. The horses used for cavalry drill were old and sick, plus those same horses were used to pull artillery. Additionally, the old hard saddles caused the cadets to have bleeding sores from riding too long. When the weather was bad, they had to perform cavalry exercises in the basement of one of the academic buildings, referred to as the riding hall. Although the basement was 65 feet wide and 200 feet long, two rows of iron columns made it difficult to ride their horses in the various formations. Multiple collisions between riders in the iron columns and riders in one another produced numerous injuries to the cadets and the horses. Thomas's predecessor, although having to deal with out-of-date equipment and poor horses, had expanded cavalry lessons from basic riding skills to incorporating the practice of cavalry tactics in the classroom as well as in the field. A system for selecting the best cavalry students as leaders in the West Point Cadet Troop led to better qualified cadets being assigned to the cavalry. George Thomas would recommend many cadets during his time at West Point, two of them being Jeb Stewart and Fitzhugh Lee. Some of his other students included Philip Sheridan, Alexander McCook, James McPherson, John Schofield, Oliver Otis Howard, and John Bell Hood. Thomas also expanded who got to practice on artillery pieces. Before Thomas got there, only fourth year students got to practice on artillery but he expanded that to incorporate second and third year cadets. From the way Thomas managed riding instructions, the cadets gave him a nickname that was to follow him throughout his career. The horses at West Point were too tired, old, and sick to handle hard riding, and Thomas tried to preserve their precarious health by preventing the cadets from riding too fast. In a normal practice session, a student would start moving at a walk, increase to a trot, then a canter, and then a gallop. During Thomas's sessions, the students moved from a walk to a trot and then eagerly awaited the order to speed up. Thomas almost always disappointed them by ordering a slow trot and then walk. Amused and annoyed by their cavalry instructor's refusal to let them ride fast, the cadets started to call him Old Slow Trot and the name stuck. Although he disappointed them on the field of instruction, 
The cadets liked Thomas. He genuinely cared for the students' welfare, and they came to him with their concerns, and he would work diligently to help them in any way he could. However, he was strict when it came to lessons. A gentleman who served with Thomas at West Point recalled that Thomas had a cool temper, was respected for his impartial justice, and was appreciated for his courteous bearing and kindly spirit toward the cadets, as he treated them as gentlemen of honor as well as soldiers. He was known as a strict instructor, but when it came to his students outside of class, he was lenient. For example, while an instructor, L.W. Brown and Oliver Otis Howard got into an argument in the mess hall, and Brown hit Howard over the head with a glass, and Howard threw the glass back at Brown. Fighting was a serious offense, but while sitting on the court-martial for Howard and Brown, he simply advocated for extra guard duty to be performed as a punishment. His leniency was so pronounced that the superintendent reprimanded him for leniency. However, another incident showed Thomas as a strict disciplinarian. John Schofield, who was a teaching assistant in the mathematics department, was accused of letting students not in the class into the section, and they made sexually inappropriate and scatological drawings on the board. Schofield was expelled for allowing this to happen, but the War Department asked the Board of Inquiry at West Point to reconsider the expulsion. Thomas and one other instructor were the only ones to vote to continue the expulsion. It seemed as though Schofield would never forgive Thomas for voting against him. In September 1852, Robert E. Lee would become superintendent of West Point, and since Lee and Thomas came from similar backgrounds and were similar in the personalities, they enjoyed working together. Things improved at West Point in March 1853 when Franklin Pierce, the new president, appointed Jefferson Davis as Secretary of War. Davis allocated more funds to West Point to improve the facilities and equipment. Lee personally was able to acquire new horses for the academy when the main cavalry recruiting barracks moved from Carlisle, Pennsylvania to St. Louis, Missouri. As West Point was improving, Thomas was improving himself. He joined the Napoleon Club started by Dennis Hart Mahan to expand instructors' knowledge of military science. He checked out numerous books about military history and presented a paper to the Napoleon Club about the battles of Frederick the Great. 